Welcome to the job site. My name is Jim, the job site safety information mentor, and I'm here to help you understand the basic safety rules concerning the fall protection requirements on this project. Falls are the leading cause of death in construction. Anytime you work at height, you need to take it seriously. I'm here to show you how to protect yourself from the common fall hazards in construction. Falls from unprotected edges, ladders, scaffolds, and roofs can be prevented. There are three simple things you can do to prevent a fall. Number one, plan ahead and make sure the job will be completed safely. So decide how the job will be done, what task will be involved, and what safety equipment may be needed to complete each task. You need to consider the different types of fall hazards that will be present, such as holes, skylights, and unprotected edges. Then select fall protection that is suitable to work safely. OSHA safety and health regulations for construction state that each employee on a working walking surface with an unprotected side or edge that is six feet or more above a lower level needs to have protection from falling. Basically, if you are this high up, you need to be protected from falling to that lower level. This can be done by the use of guardrail systems, safety net systems, or personal fall arrest systems, also known as PFAS. We will take a look at these systems shortly. Number two, provide the right equipment. Workers who are six feet or more above a lower level are at risk for serious injury or death if they should fall. To protect these workers, employers must provide fall protection and the right kinds of ladders and scaffolds required to complete the job safely. We will discuss ladders and scaffolding more in detail later. Finally, number three, everyone must be trained to use the equipment safely. Every worker should be trained on the proper maintenance, setup, safe use, and limitations of equipment they use on the job. Additionally, employers must train workers in recognizing hazards on the job. Note, subpart C of 1926.21, safety training and education states under B, employer responsibility. Two, the employer shall instruct each employee in the recognition and avoidance of unsafe conditions and the regulations applicable to his work environment to control or eliminate any hazards or other exposures to illness or injury. So remember to plan, provide, train. Let me show you the guardrail systems and personal fall arrest systems currently being used on our job site. Grab your safety gear and let's take a walk to see how these fall protection systems are being used to protect our workers. Here's our competent person for fall protection on our job site. By definition, a competent person is one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings which can be unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to employees. A competent person also has the authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate these hazards. Note that a prompt corrective measure includes stopping work to prevent worker exposure to a known hazard. No further work is to be performed in this area until the hazard is corrected. As found in the OSHA Safety and Health Regulations for Construction, 29 CFR 1926.503, Subpart M requires employers to provide a training program for each employee who might be exposed to fall hazards. The employer shall assure that each employee has been trained in the following areas as necessary by a competent person. The nature of fall hazards in the work area. The correct procedures for erecting, maintaining, disassembling, and inspecting the fall protection systems to be used. The use and operation of guardrail systems, personal fall arrest systems, safety net systems, warning line systems, safety monitoring systems, controlled access zones, and other protection to be used. The role of each employee and the safety monitoring system when this system is used. I'll show you the warning line systems, safety monitoring systems, and controlled access zones when we get to the roof area. But first, let me take you up a few floors to see the first example of our fall protection system, guardrails. Here's an excellent example of guardrails in use. According to 1926.502B, one, the top edge height of top rails or equivalent guardrail system members shall be 42 inches plus or minus three inches above the walking working level. When conditions warrant, the height of the top edge may exceed the 45 inch height, provided the guardrail system meets all other criteria of this paragraph. Note, when employees are using stilts, the top edge height of the top rail or equivalent member shall be increased in an amount equal to the height of the stilt. That way, these workers are protected from falling from heights. 
The top edge, 1926.502B, of guardrail systems needs to be able to withstand, without failure, a force of at least 200 pounds applied within two inches of the top edge in any outward or downward direction at any point along the top edge. This 200-pound force shall not deflect the top rail to a height less than 39 inches above the walking working level. Midrails, 1926.502B, 2, also known as the intermediate rail, need to be installed at a height midway between the top edge of the guardrail system and the walking working level, at least 21 inches high. This midrail must be capable of withstanding a force of at least 150 pounds applied in any downward or outward direction at any point along the midrail. Top rails and midrails shall be at least one quarter inch nominal diameter or thickness to prevent cuts and lacerations. If wire rope is used for top rails, they must be flagged at intervals six feet or less with high visibility material. OSHA has provided Appendix B as a guideline to assist employers in designing and building guardrail systems and components to meet the requirements of 1926.502. Guardrail systems can be made of construction grade lumber, Schedule 40 pipe, or structural steel angles that are at least two inch by two inch by three eighths inches. If wood is used for the guardrail system, the top rails shall be at least two inch by four inch lumber. The mid rail shall be at least one inch by six inch lumber. The posts must be at least two inch by four inch lumber spaced not more than eight feet apart on centers. For pipe railings, the top rails, mid rails, and posts must be at least one and a half inches nominal diameter schedule 40 pipe with posts spaced not more than eight feet apart on centers. For structural steel railings, top rails, mid rails, and posts must be at least two inch by two inch by three eighths inch angles with posts spaced not more than eight feet apart on centers. So if you notice, no matter which materials are being used, the post spacing is to be not more than eight feet apart on centers, just like what we have here. Measure the distance to that post over there. Great job. The performance and design criteria for these tow boards are found in 1926.502J. They need to be installed along the edge of an overhead walking working surface to protect employees below. They must be capable of withstanding a 50 pound force, have a minimum height of three and a half inches, and have no more than a quarter inch clearance above the walking working surface. So what does this mean? Just use your basic two by four board. Let me show you the guardrail system being used in the hoist area for moving materials into our building. When guardrail systems are being used in a hoisting area, a chain, gate, or removable guardrail section shall be placed across the access opening when hoisting operations are not taking place. But note, you'll need to be protected by a second fall protection system, such as a personal fall arrest system, or harness and lanyard, before you open the gate or remove the guardrail. Speaking of gates, when guardrail systems are used around holes, which are used as points of access such as a ladder way, they shall be provided with a gate or be offset so a person cannot walk directly into the hole. 